At the beginning of our three days together, looking at the last 30 years of Russian history, from Gorbachev's rise to power in 1985, right up to the present, I thought that a, a, a good introduction would be, rather than jumping right into specific events in the early 1980s, uh, would be to give you uh, a series of themes, what I call six themes or patterns of development that have profoundly shaped Russia over a long period of time in some cases going back to the beginnings of recorded Russian history. And to emphasize that these themes have fundamentally shaped uh, Russia's past and are very much at work today in Russia. And so I thought this would be a kind of a good way to approach our topic rather than starting with um, specific events in the, in the 1980s. The six themes are interrelated. Um, and uh, I'll try to explain each one over the next 60 minutes or so. I'm often asked, is Russia a European country? And believe it or not, Washington and Lee has an official position on that question. If you major in history, and I know we have some former history majors here, we have three geographic areas within the history major, and students have to concentrate in one of the three areas, North America, Europe, and well, the rest of the world. And we're rather traditional in that regard, very Eurocentric, North American-centric. Where does Russia fit in? Well, if you look at our catalog, most of the Russian history courses that I teach are in the European concentration. But we have a little caveat that the courses may be used for our global concentration. And this is my first point, that Russia is a Eurasian country. It's not a European country. And if you look at Russian history, and you go back to the very earliest parts of Russian history, Russia's early inspiration came from the Southwest. There were uh, Varangians or Vikings who worked their way down the Dnieper River looking to get to the Black Sea uh, and points farther east. And they came upon a settlement in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine today, and built it into a, a formidable and organized state. Uh, so you did have these Vikings who came down from the north. But what they did is they put the people of Rus, this area is called Rus generally, stretching between Kiev in the south and Novgorod in the north, and they put uh, Kiev in touch with Constantinople. And very importantly, fundamentally, Russia received its Christianity from the south, from Constantinople. Not from Rome, but from Constantinople, as this slide indicates. If you look at Russian history through the lens of culture, religion, art, architecture, literature, the lands of Rus are really the northern outpost of the Byzantine Empire for hundreds of years. Okay, um, Two missionaries from Byzantium gave them an alphabet so they record. There's no recorded history before the introduction of Christianity. This is very important to keep in mind that it's Christianity came from the south and not from Rome. Why do I emphasize this? Well, I want to mention one tradition in particular uh, that came out of Byzantium, something called Caesaropapism, the close working relationship between the secular head and the sacred head in the Byzantine Empire. The emperor and the patriarch work very close together. And in that relationship, the, the emperor was to protect the church. The emperor presided over church councils. And the emperor also appointed the patriarch. So in this close relationship, the, the emperor has a slight advantage over the patriarch. This tradition was carried into Russian history. Throughout Russia's history, there's always been a close relationship between church and state, between the official church, the Russian Orthodox Church, and the state, with the exception of the 74 years of communist rule, where the, the atheistic state turned on the church and terribly persecuted it through most of the 74 years, until the very end, when Gorbachev, as a result of his Glasnost campaign in 1990, uh, introduced a freedom of conscience law, which basically created religious freedom uh, in the Soviet Union. But leaving that exception aside, during the Soviet period, there was a very fierce relationship, uh, a hostile relationship, of the, the state um, persecuting the church. Russia has never had a tradition of separation of church and state. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, something that we take uh, for granted. And in the post-Soviet period, it's very interesting to see how this relationship has developed. I think you probably know, and I'm sure my colleague Alan Lynch will emphasize this fact, that, that uh, Mr. Putin has a very strong relationship with the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church today, Kirill. Well, the second influence that developed in Russia. So let me backtrack for a moment here. Um, between the late 800s 
and the middle of the 1200s. The predominant influence came from the south or the southwest, from Constantinople. But in the mid-1200s, there had been, by this time, there had been a series of steppe invaders from the east who had invaded across the broad Eurasian plain uh, into the land that we call Russia today. And in 1240, a very formidable group invaded from the east, the Mongols or Tatars. They sacked Kiev, which was the main city in Kiev and Rus. Um, they sacked the city in 1240 and maintained their control for some 240 years until 1480. Um, the Mongols established the largest empire the world has ever seen, stretching from, um, from China into the Balkans, the eastern part of Anatolia. It was an extraordinary large empire. The part that Russia was in was called the, um, the, the rule of the Golden Horde. Now, what's important about this is what comes into Russian history at this time is a very strong sense of despotism. In Kievan Rus, with its capital in Kiev, and incidentally, both Ukrainians and Russians today claim Kievan Rus as their ancestry, and there's an argument and debate among the, between the Russians and Ukrainians over this. Um, but the, the Mongols established a tradition of a strong despot. The Khan had his headquarters at a place called Sarai along the lower Volga River, and each of the princes had to bring tribute to Sarai each year. And woe to the prince who did not bring the tribute. The Mongols would send out a raiding party and devastate the city to teach them a terrible lesson that they must provide this tribute. So you see a change politically in the culture. Kievan Rus was rather decentralized. You have this association of city-states. When the Mongols come, you have a clear, strong leader. And this has been a very important tradition in Russia ever since of, of strong despotism. I don't want to overemphasize the point. In the 17th century, there was the emergence of something called the Land Assembly, or Zemsky Sabor, which met periodically when there was a crisis, like in 1613, when there was no czar, and they would elect the czar, as occurred then. And there was a council of large landowning magnates called the Bayar Duma. Bayar is a large landowner. And that met continually during the 17th century and advised the czar. So there was a an opportunity in the 17th century that Russia would develop more of a constitutional uh, political history. But by the time of Peter the Great, both the Zemsky Sabor and the Bayar Duma went out of Russian history and don't return. And so we see from the time of Peter the Great this, this principle of despotism becoming stronger. Which leads me to a very illustrious figure in Russian history that I want to say a few words about, Peter the Great. Well, from 1682 to 1725, as the slide indicates, this is the famous statue of the bronze horseman in St. Petersburg. Peter is looking to the west. And when he came to power, he wanted very much for Russia to integrate with the west, to trade with the west, and very importantly, to learn from the west. Peter built his capital city on what was a swamp where the Neva River flowed into the Gulf of Finland, the Eastern Baltic. He decided, I'm going to build my capital city here, I'm going to drain the land, and it's going to be the port from which I will trade with the West. He went abroad in 1697-98 to Europe. No Russian ruler had ever done this before. He spent about a year and a half abroad, uh, particularly in Holland and in England. And what he was particularly interested in, in those areas, was learning to build ships. Because he wants Russia to be a maritime nation, and it had no commercial fleet, it had no navy. And he spent many hours a day learning how to build ships. If Russia's going to learn a new skill, he wants to be the first to learn it. Um, shortly after coming back from that trip, he picked a fight with the major power in the northeastern part of Europe, Sweden. Uh, Sweden controlled the Baltic uh, sea coast of that territory. And he wants to break out to the Baltic to establish Russia's presence on the Baltic. And he did that in St. Petersburg. He fought a 21-year war with Sweden. He did not despise the Swedish people, however. He had extraordinary respect for them. And when he would take Swedish officers as prisoners, he would put them into his state administration. He liked them so much. In fact, some of his state building activities were patterned on Swedish models. So you have this, Peter's idea was that he would have to defeat Sweden to be taken seriously as a great power. So from the early 1700s, we see that Russia is interacting much more with the West. It becomes a great power. In, in politics, the sons and daughters of the Russian rulers, of the czars and czarinas, uh, will marry into European households, particularly German households. So 
to recap this first theme, Russia was a, a Eurasian entity. It received its inspiration originally from the southwest, then for about two and a half centuries from the east, and then from the beginning of the 1700s, uh, predominantly from Europe. As Russia developed a relationship with the West, it developed what I call a love-hate relationship with the West. In the 18th century, Peter the Great and his illustrious successor later in the century, Catherine the Great, wanted Russia very much to be a European power. Catherine stated, as the slide indicates there, that in, in 1767 she, she declared simply, Russia is a European state. She was European herself. She wasn't Russian. She was a German princess from the little principality of Anhalt Zerbst. She moved to Russia to marry the heir to the throne, the future Peter III. Within six months after he became Tsar, she overthrew him in a coup d'etat and ruled for 34 years until her death of natural causes in 1796, a woman who was very shrewd politically, a very capable ruler. Uh, if you go to St. Petersburg today and you go to the Hermitage Museum, which I know some of you have been there, you see all the artwork, much of which she brought to Russia. There's a whole room of Rembrandt paintings. She considered herself to be a daughter of the Enlightenment. She believed that she should rule with reason for the betterment of her people. Well, it was more words than action. We can have a separate conversation on that. But she did do something. She introduced more religious toleration, gave the, the old believers who are schismatics within the Russian Orthodox tradition, gave them freedom of religion, allowed Catholics and Protestants to open more churches uh, in Russia, particularly Protestants, uh, introduced some health measures, uh, um, an inoculation against smallpox. She opened up orphanages and other things. So she was very much enamored with the West. She considered herself European and that Russia was European. But we get into the 19th century, we see this oscillation begin to occur of rulers who very much admire the West, but others who pull back and say, no, Russia is distinct from the West. I just want to run through this rather, rather quickly. Her grandson came to power. There's Catherine's grandson, Alexander I, in 1801. He spoke French. French was the language of the Russian court, as it had been during Catherine's reign. You can imagine if President Obama met with his advisors and spoke only in Spanish. Now, this is what it was like in Russia, that French was the language of the court um, during Catherine's reign. Alexander was, was fluent in French. His associates among Russians tended to be Anglophile aristocrats. He was also interested in French uh, political traditions. And he had an advisor in 1809, a man named Speransky, who on the Tsar's order came up with a constitutional plan for Russia, a separation of powers, the introduction of a parliament. And Alexander was taken with that until Napoleon invaded in 1812. And then Speransky, shortly before the invasion, was sent into exile, and Alexander dropped that idea. He died in 1825, and his brother came to power at that point. He didn't have any sons, Alexander didn't. Um, but his uh, brother, Nicholas, came to power, and he ruled, as the slide indicates, for some 30 years. He wanted to separate Russia from the West. He had a minister of education, a man named Uvadov, who said Russia stands for three things. It stands for orthodoxy, meaning orthodox Christianity. Autocracy, not representative government, not constitutionalism. And what I translate as Russian national character. In Russian, narodnost, uh, uh, which literally would be something like folkness, which doesn't translate to English. He wanted to promote things Russian, particularly the Russian language. He moved in this direction for, for a couple of reasons. One was when his brother died in 1825, it was uncertain who was actually going to succeed Alexander. And there were some 3,000 liberal-minded army officers who did not want Nicholas to come to power, but his brother Constantine, who was the Russian viceroy in Poland, and that Constantine would rule with the Constitution. And Nicholas, on one morning in December of 1825, um, had a standoff with these roughly 3,000 army officers, many of whom had fought in the Napoleonic Wars and been in Paris, who wanted Russia to have a constitution. But there are about 9,000 who were against that. Nicholas finally lost patience, fired three cannon shots, killed several of the insurgents, arrested a number of the others, had five of them hanged, executed. And this turned him against the idea of Western-inspired reform. Later on, particularly in 1848, when there were rebellions in every European capital city, 
except London and St. Petersburg, he became very fearful of the uh, influenza of revolution coming to Russia. And he greatly increased censorship after 1848, uh, prevented nobles from traveling abroad, which they'd had that right since the time of Catherine the Great and even before. Uh, so he wanted to set Russia apart and believed that these three ideas, what Russia stood for was orthodoxy, autocracy, and Russian national character. He died during a major war. Britain and France became fearful of Russia's growing power vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century. Russia is making inroads down the Baltics, uh, Balkans, excuse me, down into the Balkan area, getting toward the Turkish Straits. The British and the French backed up the Ottoman Turks who went to war with Russia in 1853. And Russia became involved in the Crimean War. About 400,000 Russians died during that war, incidentally. More than Americans died in World War II, of World War II. A major siege was fought at the city of Sevastopol, which we will talk about later when we talk about Mr. Putin's annexation of the Crimea. The Crimea really resonates for Russians in their history. Nicholas died during that war. He was replaced by his son, Alexander II, who moved Russia back in the opposite direction. And this is this kind of oscillation or sine wave of a love-hate relationship uh, between Russia's rulers and the West. Alexander II brought the war to a conclusion and then he embarked upon a major set of reforms, the most important of which was emancipating the serfs. Or it was actually a long drawn out process where they had to purchase their emancipation, and purchase territory they would get. Uh, but that commenced in 1861. And then a whole host of other reforms, creation of local self-government, uh, an independent judiciary came in the wake of the emancipation of the serfs. And he's borrowing his ideas, particularly his legal reform in setting up an independent judiciary uh, from European models. However, in 1881, on March 1st, 1881, he was murdered by terrorists, by socialist terrorists who believed that the route to power was to murder top officials, including the Tsar, and this would be a signal for social revolution throughout Russia and a redistribution of wealth, dispossessing the nobles of their property and so forth. Uh, the man who actually threw the bomb that killed the Tsar was a guy named Ignaty or Ignacy uh, Uh He was uh, of Polish descent. The man who came to power when Alexander II died was his son, Alexander III. And he drew the lesson that liberal reform is the road to perdition. This raises expectations, opened up the door to terrorism. What Russia needs to do is maintain a firm autocratic structure. And you can see, I mean, just, I, I, I love this photo of Alex, not that I love Alexander III, I love the photo. Uh, you know, a very strong guy. They said that he could bend a horseshoe. He started his day by drinking black coffee and taking a cold shower. He was determined that Russia would maintain the path of autocracy, and he was very, very skeptical of any Western-inspired reform. He died in 94, relatively young uh, in age. Uh, died of uh, kidney disease, and his son Nicholas II came to power, Russia's last czar. He came to power as a die-hard monarchist and absolutist. However, under the pressure of events in 1905, after Russia lost a war against Japan, um, and as a result of growing industrial unrest in Russia, uh, Russia was in a near-revolutionary situation, and he reluctantly in 1906 introduced a constitution for Russia and a parliament but it was a very weak parliament that the Tsar could easily manipulate um, through dismissing it or using his absolute veto authority. Now, when we get into the Soviet period, we see this relationship with the West take a very strange turn. Oh, I'm sorry, I did want to show you one other slide here. This is actually quite an important slide. Um, this is a church in downtown St. Petersburg uh, called the, as the slide indicates, the Cathedral uh, of the Savior on the spilled blood. Alexander III had this church, he commissioned the church be built, and it was built right on the spot where his father had been murdered. Okay, so I had this huge cathedral built right on the spot, right in downtown St. Petersburg. Now what do you see when you look at this? What's striking about this image? Anybody? No, I haven't been taking questions. This isn't a rhetorical question, like someone to provide. Eastern and Western. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is the architecture of St. Petersburg. Peter wanted a Western-looking city. 
He patterned St. Petersburg on Amsterdam to a certain extent, a city on canals in Venice, um, but it's also his capital city. And there was a strict building code, no building over four stories high, they're rectangular, uh, with columns, like right here, columns and porticos. Um, actually, architecture that would fit very well on our campus with our neoclassical architecture. This just stands out. It's, it's striking because this is an example of what you might call Russian medieval church architecture. It looks a lot like St. Basil's in Moscow that was built in the middle of the 1500s. And this was this symbol that he was sending in the architecture that Russia is Slavic. He put this very Slavic monument right in the heart of the very Western city. And this is his way of saying that Russia is different. Russia is not European. Now, so we get into the 20th century. Of course, there's 74 years of communist rule. Communism was not indigenous to Russia. Communism came out of the brain of Marx and his collaborator Engels. Marx was an assimilated Jew from Westphalia who did most of his research and writing in Britain. Okay. Marx's ideas of communism derived uh, in part from two Western traditions, one of dialectical change, uh, an idea of uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, that history moves forward through stages, that each stage has a dominant idea, it spawns its antithesis, there is a dramatic interaction between the two and produces a new stage in history. Marx was also a materialist. He believed that that which is real is only that which you can touch, feel, smell, see. There's no spiritual world, there's no metaphysical existence, God does not exist. He combined these two ideas to come up with the idea of class struggle that history goes through stages, kind of like Piaget's theories of child development, if you've studied psychology. Um, the feudal landowner interacts with the rising capitalists. In this big confrontation, capitalism emerges. Capitalism creates its own enemy, its antithesis in the exploited, downtrodden worker. And in this conflict, the working class will emerge victorious and introduce the last stage in history, that of communism. I refer to communism as an anti-Western, Western idea. It comes out of the West, but it's arguing against the most important foundations of Western ideas and civilization. It's against private property. It's against civil society, constitutional government, belief in God. Now, there were some liberal communist reformers during the Soviet period. Um, people who wanted to provide for some measure of rights in society, of human rights, of, of freedom against coercive government, and also to have better relations with the West. Nikolai Bukharin, for instance, in the 1920s, was the theoretician of the idea of a mixed economy. Bukharin was afraid of the state using coercive powers and wanted a good section of the Russian economy, particularly peasant life in the countryside, uh, to be free, to let peasants control their their resources to sell their products at whatever price the market would bear. After Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, although on one hand he invaded Hungary in 1956 and tried to put missiles in Cuba, argued at the same time uh, that a, an Armageddon-type conflict in the future looming between the communist world and the capitalist world was not inevitable, as Stalin had preached, that we could have peaceful coexistence the fundamentally different societies could coexist together. And Khrushchev had a small opening to the outside, to, to the Western world. He came twice to the United States, for instance. The most formidable communist reformer, of course, is someone that Alan's going to talk about later today, and that is Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev is, uh, plays a very important role in the end of the Cold War, wanted to create an, a more open society, uh, to give voice, glasnost, to things that had not been talked about before, and uh, wanted Russia to have normal relations with the rest of the world. So, I've been trying to talk about this kind of oscillating relationship toward the West, kind of a love-hate relationship toward the West. I want to pick at that idea a little bit more in my third theme, and that is to look at Russia's quandary over liberal reform. What attracted Russia's rulers to the West particularly in the 19th century, was this idea of liberal reform. Now, what do I mean by liberal reform? 
Well, basically two things. One, a recognition that people have innate human rights, that we have a sense of dignity endowed by our creator, and therefore that dignity must be respected. And so what comes out of this are ideas such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, right of assembly. Russia had no um, Bill of Rights, no recognition of human rights throughout the, the 19th century. Um, what was attractive to Western liberalism was this idea. And what's connected with that is the idea of political pluralism, that one individual should not rule as an autocrat, but there should be some system of, um, of constitutionalism, of division of powers, of separation of powers. Some segment of society should share in the decision-making process together with the sovereign. And this Russia's love-hate relationship with the West boils down largely to Russia's relationship to Western liberal ideas. And the question I want to ask in this third theme is why were some of Russia's rulers attracted to Western liberalism? And then secondly, what prevented them from embracing it more fully? And here I want to go back and revisit some of the rulers I've, I've just been talking about. If we go back to Catherine the Great, she came to power in a coup d'etat in 1762. Not long after she came to power, she convened a legislative commission that was to write a law code for Russia. And she gave it a set of instructions that are infused with enlightened thought. A person is to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, for instance. In her heart of hearts, she wanted to get rid of serfdom, but she didn't. She never, she never did. Neither did um, Frederick the Great in Prussia, who had a similar mentality. Why not? Well, a group of high-ranking nobles had put her in power. She learned through the deliberations of the legislative commission that represented the nobility, the rising middle class, and even state peasants, but not privately owned serfs. She learned loud and clear that the nobility wanted to hold on to their serfs. They did not want to emancipate them. And she knew if she emancipated them, the nobility who put her in power could take her right out. So while de jure, you could say she's an autocrat, in a de facto sense, there were clear limits to what she could do and what she couldn't do, and she was always aware of that. The Legislative Commission was disbanded by Catherine in 1768. Why? It never wrote the law code, incidentally. Why? Because the Ottoman Empire went to war with Russia. And she deemed that when Russia became involved in a major war, this is not a time to consider domestic reform. After the wars with the Turks, in which Russia was victorious, she never reconvened the Legislative Commission, however. The longer she was in power, the more conservative she became. Alexander I the Tsar, who was in power at the beginning of the 19th century, had liberal inclinations and even commissioned this fellow Speransky to write a constitutional draft in 1809. But Alexander dropped the idea of liberal reform when the French invaded in 1812. Again, the, the existential crisis of this invasion by Napoleon's Grand Armée of 600,000 troops, which did take Moscow briefly, um, in the late summer and early fall of 1812, this was not a time to consider liberal reform, and he dropped the idea. He returned to, that is Alexander I, returned to constitutional plans between 1818 and 1820, but when there were liberal military revolts in Spain and in Italy, he dropped the idea again. He's rather an enigmatic, enigmatic czar. Um, Alexander II is the most interesting Example in this regard, he's there on the left. He is the one who really wanted to create civil society in Russia. As I mentioned previously, he emancipated the serfs. He introduced local self-government, something called the Ziemstva, uh, introduced a judicial reform, uh, increased the, the number of schools in Russia. But there were, ver there were several red lines beyond which he didn't want to go. He was a self-limiting reformer. He wanted to introduce local self-government, but not l have that lead or develop momentum to form a national parliament. Okay? He wanted to emancipate the serfs, but at the same time maintain the nobility's privileged position. And basically what they did is they made the serfs pay a lot for their emancipation and the property they got. Okay? He wants to keep the empire together. The larger the empire got in the 19th century, and Russia's expanding into Central Asia and the Far East, um, of course in the 18th century took Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, about two-thirds of of pre-partition Poland. The larger Russia gets, the smaller of the percentage of the population are the Russian people. 
And the idea of local self-government, if it leads to a national parliament, well, this could lead to a fragmentation of the Russian Empire. He wants to keep the empire intact. These are his three red lines. Now, I put up here Gorbachev because I see that Gorbachev had a similar dilemma. Gorbachev wanted to create civil society. He wanted to create what he called democratization, democratization. But there were red lines for him, too. He wanted to stay in power himself. Okay. He um, did not have a nobility as a privileged group in society, but he had the Communist Party. He did not want his reforms to subvert the power of the Communist Party. He wanted it to maintain its leading role in society. And he wanted to keep the Soviet Union intact. Clearly, Gorbachev failed. He fell from power in 1991. The historical verdict on Alexander II is still out, and historians have spilled a lot of ink and written many, many books about where, where Russia is going in the late 19th century. Was liberal reform sustainable in Russia or not? I put up at the top of the slide a famous quote from the Frenchman who visited America, Alexis de Tocqueville. The most dangerous moment for a bad government is when it begins to reform, because you raise expectations. Alexander had people who welcomed, were enthusiastic about emancipation until they read the fine print and saw the peasants for 49 years were going to have to make payments to landlords to get their freedom. And that creates frustration. And that is so dangerous in a dynamic where you raise people's hopes and then, well, have to lower them. Gorbachev has the same dilemma. Expectations rose dramatically. I remember taking some 30 WNL students to the Soviet Union in 1989 and viewing the talking revolution where Gorbachev had allowed basically freedom of expression, and, and people were wildly enthusiastic about that in 1989. So to, to wrap up this, this theme, Russia's quandary over liberal reform, let me suggest to you that when you boil down all this detail I've been talking about, the, what prevented Russia from adopting meaningful liberal reform are really three things. When you look at the examples from Catherine the Great and Alexander the First and Alexander the Second, and even, even Gorbachev in the late Soviet period, is first of all an external threat to imperial security. Catherine disbanded the legislative commission when the Ottoman Turks attacked. You don't engage in reform when there is a powerful external threat. Likewise, Alexander the First was taken with the idea of constitutionalism, but when France invaded, he drops that idea. So one concern was a the external threat. The second factor that prevented Russia from adopting meaningful reform was the perception of an internal threat to imperial security. Alexander II was very much afraid of the nobility losing its privileged position. This could create social instability within Russia. Um, Alexander II also was concerned about the integrity of the Russian Empire. In 1863, the peoples in the empire who, who most resented the fact they were a part of the Russian Empire, the Poles, rose in rebellion after Russia tried to conscript Polish troops into the army. And there was a massive rebellion in, in the Polish part, the Russian territory, in 1863. So the idea is that liberal reform can entice nationality unrest within the Russian Empire. And that's deemed to be very, very dangerous. The third obstacle to liberal reform was a perceived threat to the autocrat him or herself. Catherine the Great did not emancipate the serfs because she was afraid of how the nobility would react to that. They may depose her. They brought her into power. They may take her right out. Um, Alexander II became somewhat cool to the idea of domestic reform after attempts on his life. And there were seven, and the seventh was, was successful. Uh, the first attempt on his life was in 1866. A guy named Karakazov tried to, to kill him. Uh, they even blew up the Winter Palace at one point. The terrorists got actually right within the Winter Palace itself. Uh, this cooled his ardor for reform. The idea that he was raising expectations within society, and then some took it to the conclusion, we need to get rid of the autocracy altogether. Alexander III, clearly, derived the lesson from his father's experience that liberal reform is the road to perdition. And he saw, he watched his father die in front of him when he was brought back to the Winter Palace on March 1st, 1881. He was not going to pursue liberal reform. He thought that was the road to ruin for Russia. Okay, let me move on to some more themes uh, that I want to mention to change gears here a little bit. Um, throughout American history, many, individuals, going all the way back to John Winthrop, who came across uh, 
a ship with the Puritans in the early 1600s, uh, have seen America as being exceptional, that there's something special about America. Um, Winthrop famously said that America is that city upon a hill. And many American presidents have quoted that. Uh, John Kennedy used that phrase. Um, Ronald Reagan, George Bush. And where that comes from is, is the Bible of Jesus uh, saying, it's recorded in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, that, I didn't memorize it entirely, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And this is the metaphor that Winthrop used to America. America was this refuge for people who were being persecuted, in the case of the Puritans for their faith. And they're going to create the new society, the new Jerusalem, that America is special in God's, in God's plan. Look at Thomas Paine, who was probably, some of you in the room may know Paine's background better than I do, an agnostic, um, very much a, a secular thinker. But in writing Common Sense in 1776, he appealed to that Protestant sentiment in America. And he writes in Common Sense, which I use in my, one of my history classes, he says, is it any coincidence that North America was discovered right before the Reformation, as if the Creator wanted to provide a sanctuary for those who were persecuted. Again, the idea that America is important in God's plan. Well, Russia has kinds of exceptionalism that have varied over time in their own history. And uh, incidentally, Mr. Putin has very, uh, got, had a very negative reaction when President Obama recently referred to American exceptionalism. And he's been promoting an idea of Russian exceptionalism, which we'll get to later in our three days together. But let me go back to 1510. In 1510, there was an abbot, the head of a monastery, in the area of Piskov, which was near the Russian-Polish border at this time. And in 1510, this abbot Filofie wrote a letter to the Grand Prince in Moscow, who was Vasily III. And he said the following. He said, the first organized home of Christianity was Rome. But Rome lost its authority as a result of various heresies and the barbarian invasions, okay, in the 400s, three and 400s. At that point, the home of Christianity became Constantinople in the Orthodox East. And they, had, they were promoting religious truth and did so until the Ottoman Turks took the city in 1453. And then the Ottoman Turks took over most of the rest of the Orthodox Christian world, where the patriarchates were located, not only Constantinople, but Jerusalem, uh, Antioch, Alexandria, was all taken over by the Ottoman Turks. The main area that was not controlled by the Ottoman Turks was to the north of the Black Sea, in Russia. And Filofie said, quote, in this letter to the Grand Prince of Moscow, Vasily III, two Romes, two Romes have fallen. The third stands, and there shall be no fourth. That third Rome being Moscow. And so Moscow has a divine place, or has a place in God's divine plan, that it was the protector of the true variant of Christianity, and it must defend it, and then eventually to expand it. If there are Christians who are enslaved by the heathens, by the infidel Turks, they should be liberated, or by the Mongols. Uh, Ivan the Terrible learned that there were some 100,000 um, Christians in the city of Kazan who were controlled by the, the Tatars, the Mongol Tatars, and he took the city in the early 1550s, uh, and that's why St. Basil's Cathedral was built outside Moscow, to commemorate the liberation of these Christians who were held by the, um, by the infidel. Um, and this idea developed in Russia in the early 1500s, that Russia had, that Moscow had a special divine mission to protect orthodoxy. Now let's jump forward some 300 years into the 1800s. In 1836, a Russian nobleman uh, who had been in the Napoleonic campaigns and very much admired Roman Catholicism, a guy by the name of Peter or Pyotr Chayadayev uh, wrote a document that was translated as his philosophical letter. He first wrote it, I think, in 1829 in either Latin or French, then had it translated into Russian in 1836. And in this letter, he said the following, quote, we, meaning Russians, do not belong to any of the great families of the human race. We are neither of the West nor of the East. 
we have not added a single idea to the sum total of human ideas, unquote. What an indictment that Russian cultural history is a big zero. It's contributed nothing. The advantage of this was that Russia could borrow. And he, of course, was, he was an ardent westernizer. He admired Roman Catholicism. He wanted Russia to integrate more in the West. Well, did this provoke a storm of controversy? In fact, Chaidaf was declared insane and was put under psychiatric care, however that existed in the 19th century. And a whole group of scholars, uh, the uh, uh, Kudyevsky brothers, the Aksakov brothers, said this is rubbish. There, is, there are things that are very important in Russia. In fact, the Russians are morally superior. And here's how. Let me just run through quickly the group who became known as the Slavophiles, their critique of the West and why they thought Russia was superior. They said in the West, you have class division. And that's a bad thing. You've got um, political partisanship through constitutionalism, and that's very divisive. People are alienated from their place of work. Factories are beginning to develop in the 1830s and the 1840s. They said in the West, people go to work just because they need the wage. They're not, they don't relate at all to the widgets that the factory's producing. What we Russians have is something called subornus or communalism. We have an integral wholeness that the West doesn't have. We don't compete, we cooperate. The West has become urban, of course, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, the urban phenomenon in Western Europe, urbanization. Um, life has become more complicated and differentiated. What Russia has is a, a rural lifestyle that is integrally whole. The farmer drinks the milk from the cow that he milks himself. He's connected to the results of his labor. Uh, and that Russia should urbanize to some extent, but, but go slowly. It should base its future on its agricultural organic traditions. The West prides itself on universal reason, that we need to build government structures based on reason. Going back to the writings of Locke and others, right? this presumption of, that people are reasonable. What the Slavophiles said is we have tradition. And any change that should come to Russia should be based on our organic traditions. We shouldn't lock, stock, and barrel borrow someone else's model that's based on this presumption of reason. They actually have great skepticism about the validity of human reason and how deep that runs. Finally, yes, Western society is more materially advanced, but the West has lost its soul. And what Russia has is a unique soul, a Ruska Dusha, a Russian soul that is embedded in the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, if these ideas sound familiar, and if you've read some versions of them recently, the idea that Russians are morally superior to a decadent West, I suggest to you that Mr. Putin is a 21st century Slavophile. The idea that he's somehow trying to recreate the Soviet Union, oh, that's, that's rubbish, at least in a political sense. He has no affection for communism. What he's diving into is Slavophile thought of the 19th century and bringing it into the 21st century. Now, one more manifestation of this Russian exceptionalism. During the communist era, a portion of the Communist Party was its international wing, the common turn, the communist international movement, the motto of which you see the symbol there on the left, workers of the world unite. The communism had this missionary zeal that it, the Soviet Union believed, it had a, a market on political and social truth in communism. It needed to protect that against all those who wanted to subvert communism within the Soviet Union and then spread it eventually to the, to the rest of the world. And like a religious movement, it was fearful of both heretics and infidels. The infidels were the capitalists, those outside the gates. The, the heretics, however, were arguably more dangerous because they're among you and they are other socialists or communists who are not going to follow Russia's lead. And here I have in mind the conflict between Stalin and Tito in the late 1940s. Tito said, well, I'm a communist. I control the Balkans, and we know communism better than you do in the Soviet Union. And Stalin was very fearful of the, the communist heretic. But the idea I, I want to tie into here with exceptionalism is under communism, there was a sense of exceptionalism, that, that Moscow was the home of communism, need to, needed to protect that against those who wanted to subvert communism and then spread it abroad in a kind of missionary zeal. Two more themes, and then I'll take some questions. Here's a map of the USSR, the Soviet Union. I remember a conversation I had back in 1989 uh, with a, a Russian friend of a history colleague of mine. And I suggested to him, I said, you know, the Soviet Union is, is the last of the great European empires. 
And he was shocked. No, we, we believe in Druzhba Naroda, friendship of peoples. We're, we're not an empire. But I really do think the Soviet Union was the last of the great European empires. Look at the history of the 20th century. After the, the Great War, which we're commemorating because it was 100 years ago now, um, the empires on the losing side in the Great War lost their empires. The Ottoman Empire was broken up, eventually became successor states, including Israel in 1948 after a period of, of mandate control by the British. Uh, the German Empire was broken up. Poland became an independent state partly out of Germany. Um, and Germany lost some of its overseas possessions in, in Africa. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up into a number of successor states. Uh, Czechoslovakia, for instance, Austria and Hungary became independent states. The Russian Empire, too, um, collapsed during a time of revolution and civil war. But Russia has a very strange trajectory. It has a long and bloody civil war, some three years, killed seven to eight million people. But the communists put most of the Russian Empire back together. Okay. I'm going to leave that thought hanging and talk about end of World War II and then come back to, to the new Soviet Union. After World War II, the victorious powers gradually shed their empires, the British and the French, who retained their empires after World War I, okay, when the map of Europe was redrawn. You think of you know, India gaining its independence in 1947, or, or Algeria's torturous road to independence in the early 1960s from France. The Soviet experience, however, was, was unique in the sense that it was a loser in the First World War. It, forced a hum it signed a humiliating peace treaty with Germany in March of 1918, right after the communists came to power. And Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania became independent. Poland was this phoenix that rose from the ashes, became a, a nation again in 1918 after disappearing from the map of Europe in 1795 after the third partition of Poland. Um, but the Soviet Union held on to most of the rest of the Russian Empire in the Caucasus uh, and in Central Asia. And then after World War II, the Soviet Union gained back those areas it had lost um, at the end of the Great War, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, part of Finland, and extended its military and political control all the way to the Brandenburg Gates in Germany and gained a satellite empire in East Central Europe. Under Gorbachev, through the failure of his reforms, we see the Soviet Union collapse into some um, 15 different nation states. And so I suggest to you that the, the decolonization of the Soviet Union fits into this pattern of decolonization in the 20th century. That is the triumph of the ideas of President Wilson's ideas of national self-determination, that independent states Ukraine, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, countries in Central Asia, all became independent states. So I see this as, as a logical progression of decolonization in the 20th century, that of the great European powers, the Soviet Union held on to its empire the longest. One final theme that will relate back to the one I've just been talking to. In Russian history, there have been two times where everything just fell apart, where there was a struggle for power at the top, which led to civil war, famine, foreign intervention. And in Russia, these are called times of trouble, or smutno evremia. The first one was between 1598 and 1613. What happened in 1598 is Russia didn't have an heir to the throne. One thing that the Grand Princes of Moscow were very good at doing, going all the way back to the 1100s, was finding women that they could marry who would give birth to baby boys. Because the line of succession uh, was patrilineal, went from father to son. If there wasn't a son, it would go to a brother, but a male successor. They always had a male successor for hundreds of years. In 1598, they don't have one, partly because Ivan the Terrible killed his eldest son, but that's another story to talk about. In 1598, a man by the name of Fyodor died, and there's no heir. And this became the trigger point, if you will, for, for internal chaos within Russia. There was a, um, a social rebellion at the time, led by a guy named Bolotnikov, uh, a massive uh, social uprising of the have-nots against the haves. There were various pretenders to the throne. There are people who claim to be 
uh, Dmitry Ivanovich, a son of Ivan the Terrible, who had died under mysterious circumstances. So there are various pretenders running around Russia trying to claim the throne. There was a terrible famine, and it became an occasion for King Sigismund of Poland. He saw a golden opportunity here with this chaos in Russia to go in and to take Russian territory. And Polish troops occupied Moscow in 1610 and stayed there for two years until there's this national revival, we could say, uh, of, of um, nobility in Russia, but also many commoners, uh, including a butcher by the name of Minin, uh, who led this national resurgence and expelled the Poles in 1610. And then the next year they elected a czar, uh, a 16-year-old boy, Mikhail Romanov. Incidentally, the day in which the Poles were expelled from Moscow, November 4, was introduced by President Putin as a new holiday in Russia, uh, the Day of National Unity. Um, November 7 had been the big holiday in the communist calendar, uh, the day commemorating when the Bolsheviks took power. Putin has no regard for the communists, get rid of November 7 as an official holiday, but introduced November 4, Day of National Unity, which was introduced, incidentally, most Russians had no idea what it was. They, they didn't know what this holiday referred to, but you can see what does this represent when Russia gained its liberation from Poland? This is a holiday that's very much directed against Poland that Mr. Putin has introduced. That was the first time of troubles. The second time of troubles was in the 20th century, Russia's revolution and civil war period. Maybe seven, eight million people died in the Russian Civil War. The Bolsheviks had many opponents, the British, French, 15,000 American troops all intervened into Russian territory to try to shape the outcome and to unseat the Bolsheviks. Um, Japanese troops went a couple thousand miles inland uh, from the east all the way to Lake Baikal. Uh, and Poland uh, invaded into Ukrainian territory and actually held Kiev uh, during the uh, summer of 1920, hoping to create a vibrant buffer state between itself and communist Russia. Now, why do I mention these two time of troubles? Not so much for the events themselves, but to look at what happened shortly after the time of troubles. What we see is a rapid, in each case, after 1613 and after 1921, a rapid reconstitution of Russian power. 1613, a teenage boy who has a weak hold on the throne was elected by a Zemsky Sabor, a land assembly, to become czar. By 1667, Russia has gained control of Kiev, or Moscow, I should say, has gained control of Kiev for the first time in its history. The empire expands rapidly, laying the foundation for Peter the Great at the end of the 1600s to expand it even more and to create actually an empire. And Peter's the first to use the term empire to describe Russia and taking territory along the Baltic. In the 20th century, Russia, although the Bolsheviks had won the Civil War, the land they inherited by 1921 is starving to death around them. There's a terrible famine. Yet, in a relatively short period of time, some 20, four years later. The communists have taken over all the territory they lost during the Civil War, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Polish territory, and have established a satellite empire where they extend their political and military control all the way up, as I mentioned earlier, to the Brandenburg Gates. What I find remarkable is that after both times of troubles, you see a rapid reconstitution of Russian state power. Now, some people have suggested that since 1991, Russia has been experiencing a third time of troubles. And here's the, the contemporary map, at least of the European part of Russia. Let me just point out a, a few things here. The city of Kharkov, or Kharkiv, as the Ukrainians say, first came under Russian control in 1656. So the breakup of the Soviet Union, this is the first time that this area was not under Moscow's control. Kiev, 1667 came under Russian control. It's now independent and, of course, the capital of Ukraine. Tallinn and Riga, the capitals of Estonia and Latvia, respectively, were conquered by Peter the Great in 1710. Yes, they did have 20 years of independence following the First World War between 1918 and 1940, um, but they came under Russian control in 1710, were reincorporated into the, the Soviet Union, but they're, now they are independent cities. Uh, Sevastopol, Crimean Peninsula, conquered by the Russians in 1783. Minsk, first, uh, the second partition of Poland, 1793, came under Moscow's control. Vilnius, 
the capital of Lithuania, 1795, third partition of Poland, came under Russian control. In other words, you look at the map of Russia today, the boundaries of Russia today are roughly approximate with Russia's boundaries in the middle of the 1600s. And this has led some to say this is a third time of troubles. Now, of these cities I just mentioned, one is Russian, again, Sevastopol, as a result of Russia's annexation of Crimea in March of last year. And I want to leave you with a rhetorical question. Will Russia follow the pattern of theme five I was talking about, of national self-determination, which was Woodrow Wilson's ideas at the end of the Great War that, that boundaries should be determined by the peoples themselves, people who have a common language and cultural tradition and so forth should have their own nation state. Will Russia respect that? Or are we going to see replicated the aftermath of the first two times of troubles in the 1600s and the early 20th century where we see a, a rapid reconstitution of imperial authority? And I think that's the moment we're at in history right now. Again, these themes, I think, some have played out over hundreds of years of time, but each that I've mentioned, I think, is, has played a role in Russian history over the last 30 years and is playing a role in Russian history uh, right up to the present. You have any questions? You've been very quiet and <laughs> appreciative. Yeah. Um, either you didn't mention or I didn't catch the attitudes of the Nicholases toward liberal reform after the death of Alexander III and before the Russian Revolution? Yeah, yeah, I, I glided over that quickly to try to fit this into 60 minutes. Um, <laughs> Nicholas II came to power very much the mindset of his father, that he believed he had been given absolute authority and he had to hold on to that. He was extremely reluctant to engage in liberal reform. But as a result of the crisis of 1905 and 1906, he relented and he really had no choice. Um, Russia fought a war with Japan. Japan started the war. Uh, Russia was humiliated in the Russo-Japanese War. Prior to the start of that war, there were severe social tensions in Russia as a result of its rapid industrialization. The capital city of, uh, of St. Petersburg and Moscow were very industrial cities and the workers really had uh, really no rights. Uh, there's, no const there's no guaranteed bill of rights. They're paid low wages, they're working long hours, they have no right to vote, uh, and there were industrial work stoppages in Russia. In 1905, Russia experienced its first general strike. Uh, and Nicholas was basically told in the summer of 1905, you have two choices. You can either declare martial law or you can introduce some package of reforms to try to get the moderate opposition on your side, basically liberal opposition, isolate the socialists and crush them. And he opted for this, this latter wrote. According to his, um, his main advisor, Vita, um, Sergei Vita told him that, um, um, uh, that he would uh, shoot himself if the Tsar wanted him to impose uh, martial law. And so he didn't go that route. So he introduced this constitution very, very reluctantly. But the Duma that he set up, note incidentally that the Russian parliament is called the Duma today. The Duma was a very weak body. The Tsar could dismiss it at will. He could uh, engineer the, the mechanism as to who had the right to vote. And by the time of the third Duma, only about 2% of the population had the right to vote. Um, he had absolute veto authority. So he could frustrate the will of the Duma in many ways. Incidentally, you know, the word Duma you know, has as its root Dumat, which means to think. It doesn't mean to act or to legislate. And I think that Nicholas had in mind some sort of advisory body, and he could take their advice or not. The Russian Duma that was introduced in 1993 through Yeltsin's constitution, well, he chose the same, same body, which I think is an indication of how, how both Yeltsin and Putin view the Duma uh, today. Yeah? The tagging on to that question, it would seem that allowing particularly the French investment in the late 19th century and early 20th century provides a massive change to the whole Russian concept. Why did Alexander III, who was against, if you will, the West, and, and Nicholas, yeah. whatever, but the idea of why they let all this French money in? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very good question. Actually, there's something that's even more striking than that. Well, part of it is development. They, they want to develop the country for national security purposes in particular. They can't get troops to the, to the Far East. So they build the Trans-Siberian Railroad. They have to borrow technology and resources from abroad. 
But there's an example in Alexander III's reign that's even more striking than, than French investment. Um, in 1891, Russia signed an alliance with France, which was just absolutely shocking. And it's a result of uh, Wilhelm II's ignorance in uh, getting rid of Bismarck, who was always keen to balance uh, Russia and the West and make sure that Germany didn't find itself in a two-front war. Um, he sacked Bismarck and then, uh, that is, Wilhelm II did, and thereby alienated Russia. France saw a golden opportunity because it had been defeated by the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71 and approached the Russians for an alliance. And when a, Rush, excuse me, when a French warship put into port in St. Petersburg in 1894, came into port, Alexander III, the symbol of absolutism in Europe, now, every other country has some sort of parliament by this time, he comes out, he hears the, the hymn of the French Revolution, the Marseillaise being played, he takes off his hat and stands at attention. I mean, it's the world turned upside down. And this is the diplomatic revolution of the 20th century, is the Russian-French alliance, which of course scared Germany. They weren't too afraid of, of Russia in 1914, but they said a generation down the road with its enormous natural resources and population, war is better sooner than later. And that leads us into the maelstrom of the Great War. Yeah. Yes. How does the Russian military change over the time period from Peter the Great to you today? Yeah. Well, that's a very long question, and <laughs> I don't have too much time, but let me answer it in, in, in a certain way. One factor that helped convince Alexander II to emancipate the serfs was actually the need for military reform. Russia had a system whereby a certain percentage of young men were drafted under Peter's reign uh, for life. They didn't return home. And villages would officially say goodbye to the young men who were taken away in chains often and branded so in case they ran away they could be apprehended. Uh, it was a, a very brutal institution. Um, given that situation, they could not demobilize their troops. You went to the Russian army, you're basically there for life because it was deemed socially impossible, impractical to let people back to their villages who had been this very repressive institution, had used to learn weaponry, learned to kill people, and send them back to the village as serfs. They couldn't do that. So if you want to modernize the military after the defeat in the Crimean War, which Russia really see, saw that it needed to do, and increase the size of the military, you have to emancipate the serfs. Uh, so Russia went in 1874 towards universal male conscription, and the Russian military was, was stronger as a result. They defeated the Turks very handily in a war in 1877-78. So that's kind of a partial answer. Maybe time for one or two more questions, but I know we've got a strict schedule that we have to, uh, have to maintain. Yes, sir. First, to answer your question. Oh, the rhetorical that, question. OK. That is that uh, I think that's the way we're headed. Which way? Uh, we're headed for another uh, expansion of Russia. Okay. Well, that's what we're going to be taking up in the next couple of days together. <laughs> My question yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you mentioned that Putin is close to the patriarch. Yes. Yeah. And I have read where he has diverted funds mm -hmm. to build churches yeah. and to develop churches. Uh, my question yeah. is, yeah. two questions really. Yeah. One, do you have information about that? Yeah. And two, where that's headed? What do you yeah. think yeah. the impact of that will be? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's another complicated question. Um, Alan Lynch referred to the uh, Christ the Savior Church in Moscow that was rebuilt in the 1990s. Purportedly, what I've read from private donations, I think officially there, there was no... There's a lot of pressure. You know, if you yeah, right, right, pressure from the like state. Yeah. Zoning, you know, yeah. for the building. You know, right. you know, people appreciate it. You know, we know this. Yeah. There's a lot of politics. Yeah. And the church I've read accounts where the church... Um, was involved and was it vodka or tobacco sales in Russia? Uh, uh, alcohol yeah. and tobacco. Yeah, that's those two, right. Alcohol and tobacco sales, they've gotten money there. There was a famous scene where Kirill, there was a picture of him taken that was broadcast in the media. He's on a, a, a glossy desk and he's got this watch worth thousands and thousands of dollars. And when they saw that, they airbrushed that out. Uh, the church has become a wealthy institution. One more very quick question. I know we've got to take a break. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play devil's advocate there. Yeah. 
threatening the Baltics right now. What is our response to the threat of the Baltics? We moved the NATO. We said we moved advisors. In. What do you, you think is going to happen in the Baltics? Well, um, I tend to think that Putin actually, to an extent, is a rational actor. I, I don't think he wants to pick a fight directly with NATO. Having said that, you have to base your defense policy not on what you perceive your potential adversary's intentions to be, but what your adversary is capable of doing. Stalin didn't learn that lesson in 1941. He was determined that Hitler was not going to invade. It made no sense. It wasn't logical. You'll give an ultimatum before you invade. And Stalin's thought process was purely logical, was irrational. The problem was his adversary wasn't. Okay? Um, it would present an existential dilemma for NATO, of course, because an attack on one is an attack on all. But if you read the NATO charter carefully, it does not obligate nations to go to war with the aggressive nation. Each is to take its own course, its own path. Um, the Russians seized a, a um, Ukrainian uh, intelligence official several months ago. No one's heard from him. That, that's an, uh, I'm sorry, what did I say? Estonia. Estonia. It was Estonia, yeah. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion of that in the press. What happened to this man? That, that's an act of aggression itself. Uh, but we'll take up that question in other sessions. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Okay, sure.